again and again and all are the same. And clearly they are not because Choi Li Fat doesn't look like Wing Chun, doesn't look like Punga, doesn't look like... So, yeah, there is a difference. And I think that all my clubs are constantly overthrown because of artifacts, even though they refer in some way to fighting. I'm personally, I'm most interested in the combative aspects and how these combative aspects are related to cultural assumptions, to ideologies. So I want to talk about straight lines and magic circles, the martial arts myth of geometry. I start with three quotes, and I start um, with the notion of the straight line. The first quote is from a um, pretty recent book, I think from 2014, yes, um, from a book, Fit to Fight, the Complete Manual of Self-Defense for Women. As a straight line is the shortest distance between two points, a straight punch is the quickest way to hit someone. I suppose most of you will have heard this assumption one or the other way, and you can find it again and again. So this is from a book. Uh, this is from a homepage, from a web page, from a Wing Chun teacher. Simple geometry helps helps keeps uh, this is in homepage, helps keeps the straight punch invisible. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. This shortest distance therefore allows the fastest travel, meaning the straight punch is the quickest. Um, and you also find it in internet discussions, and I've, I found that that's a little bit uh, uh, older than the one, even 10 years before. Uh, my sensei often brought the impact of the straight punch home with the mantra, the shortest route between two points is a straight line. The point being that it is quicker and harder to block. Yeah. And he is referring from 2004 to his sensei, uh, so that notion obviously had been also been transferred for a while before that. Um, where does it come from? Can we, can we trace a historical source, an origin for that source? I mean, I suppose many people would have had this idea, but there seems to be a line of thought that goes on through the history of martial arts. And I think we can trace that back to the man, Bruce Lee. Uh, I have a quote um, from the Tao of Kung Fu, which was probably, you know more about it, which was edited by a little out of, of uh, notes that Bruce Lee did. So I don't know, unfortunately I don't know how much exactly in this quote now is Bruce Lee and how much is little editing. But you find this, this um, is a condensation of a thought that you find actually in Bruce Lee's, I think, thought and teaching. The art of straight hitting, punching in a straight and direct line, is the foundation of scientific skill. It is the end result of thousands of years of careful analysis and thought. It was observed that a straight punch has less distance to travel than do round of circular arm blows, which means that it will always reach the mark before these others strike. So, in the case of Bruce Lee, where does this idea come from? Again, I mean, you have the straight hitting, of course, in the Wing Chun system, um, which influenced Bruce Lee uh, to a great degree. But um, he himself, obviously, he deducted this thought much more from another trace uh, or from another tradition of fighting, which is the Western fighting tradition, which is fencing. Of course, Bruce Lee, and this is now Bruce Lee himself, wrote in a letter, um, basically it, like Jeet Kune Do now, or his fighting system, basically it is Western sword fencing without a sword. Uh, and we know that he read um, the teachings of several fencing teachers of the early 20th century, especially he was influenced by Naldi, who was a successful Italian fencing, fencing teacher and Olympic fencer. Uh, and Bruce Lee devised that the, we should have a punch that is on the straight line as the basic, as the fundament of our fighting system, um, according to the straight thrust of the Western fencing tradition. And then again, Nali and the Spencers in the 20th century, where do they get the ideas from? And when you look at historians of European martial arts up to rather recently, up to the, like, let's say, 1980s, like 1990s, people had this idea that you have an evolution of the Western martial arts, that they get more and more refined, and that what in the Middle Ages people were doing was, a, was an unsophisticated and actually not effective way of fighting, and that only with the invention of thrust fencing proper fighting began, which is total nonsense. Yeah. But you can clearly see this thought. And um, where can you trace that thought back? So we're getting further further back in time. Um, you can trace that back um, to, well, there's some authors in that, but most, I think the most influential is Camilo Agrippa, yeah. who um, publishes his book on fencing, on thrust fencing, in uh, 1553, no, originally. And the book is called uh, Tratato di Scientia di Arme. So it is about the science of fighting. And the full title is um, Together with a Dialogue on the Philosophy of the Art. Something. 
And I took this image here because it is, it is the first guard, like the first starting position that is depicted in the book. And there you clearly see how he um, constructs and defines fencing according to the rules of geometry. Yeah. Yeah. He has a lengthy discussion in the, in the second part of the book, in this uh, dialogue, how to construct uh, geometrical di diagrams, yeah. how to use the circle, um, the compass, sorry, the compass to construct geometric, geometrical forms. And he explains his way of fencing by geometrical forms. This is the first God, and he writes in this book, I have the translation from Ken Monshine here, um, just as in the figure, a straight line is longer and also quicker. So he bases his fencing system on thrusting more or less exclusively. I think there are some cuts I'm not perfect expert on, on Agrippa fencing, <coughs> but he bases his fencing system more or less on thrusts. Uh, in contrast to other Italian um, sword fighting styles that were um, back then still on vogue, um, the, for example, Marozzo, an, another Italian fencing author who wrote like 20 years before him, he was heavily employing also cuts and thrusts. Yeah. But he concentrates on the thrust style and he explains in his book lengthy why the thrust will always hit home earlier than the other one. Yeah. And of course, I mean, the, the idea for every one of us, this is very simple. Yeah, you have two points. What is the, quick, the, the shortest connection? Straight line. So punch on the straight line, thrust on the straight line with your sword, you would hit first. Okay. There's a problem to that. We live in a physical world, not on the, on the <laughs> blackboard of geometry. So as soon as you put the idea into uh, actual uh, physical reality, it is blocked. Yeah. It is in space. It is simply not true. Speaking about uh, moving bodies, um, the human body is a very complicated uh, thing, and even, even with the most simple experiment, you can show that this notion is not true. The brachistochrome problem was posed in the end of the 17th century by a Swiss mathematician, Jakob Ben Mulli, and he asked the question, if you have point A and point B, what is the shortest way, if you let a ball roll down in some of the other way, what is the, not the shortest way, the shortest is of course the straight line. What is the quickest way? On which way will the ball travel the shortest? Yeah. And his brother, um, interestingly, Johann Bernoulli, his younger brother, answered this question then. He was the first who um, um, had, a, had an equation for that. Um, and he, he found out the brachistochrome, so the shortest, the quickest way, sorry, I always mix it up myself, <laughs> not the shortest, but the quickest way, it's actually not the straight line, but uh, I think I have to do it. How do you get to reverse the slot? Yeah. <laughs> so then you can see. Six can control gravity. Yeah. <laughs> this is proving that in this experiment, yeah. this is the quickest way. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't prove anything about the human body. That's an argument, but next point. But what it does prove is that the basic assumption you have to punch on the straight line because it is the shortest and thus the quickest is not based in geometry. Yeah. Yeah. That does not mean that punching on a straight line or thrusting on a straight line is a bad idea in combat. Of course, you can punch somebody in the face pretty hard. It works well. Yeah? <laughs> it's a proven fighting method. But the, the geometrical foundation for it, uh, the assumption that it is the, the quickest way, is uh, plainly wrong. Yeah. And still it has been given on and on and on over generations of martial arts offenses and traveled around the world, basically. Went from the <coughs> European tradition to Bruce Lee and now you find it everywhere. Um, and this is where something like a mythization, I think, sets in of combative movement. Because what Bruce Lee does and what the, what the authors before him him do what Camillo Agrippa does is there is, is an assumption because we know that the world is built on geometry the world is built on the laws of science once we design our fighting system according to these laws of science we know that it is true we are creating a method of invincibility our fighting system will be supreme and this is where a mythization, I think, says it. They're creating a myth of geometry. Very obvious in the, in the um, early modern age, when people assumed 
that um, God, the creator, created the world according to the laws of geometry, and these laws are, are simple and beautiful. Yeah. So once your fencing system is simple and beautiful too, it is true to the world itself. It's true to the will of God. And thus you have to fence like this. Uh, I think that we can describe these myths, the function of these myths, quite accordingly to the function of myths in religions. However, all these problem, however problematic all these terms are, and I want, do not want to go into further discussion of this, but I think that myths in the martial arts, uh, similar to those in religion, lay foundation for action. Where does my martial art come from? It comes from the laws of geometry. They create leg legitimation. Why are the movements of my martial art correct? Yeah. Because you move according to the sacred laws of geometry. And they form the world, yeah, especially the social world. Who are we? Who are the others? We are the ones who fight true. The other ones are those who <laughs> fight stupid. Yeah, That's the basic idea. Yeah. And you find that in, in various variations. In this case, it is the myth of geometry that is the fundament. Yeah. And this myth of geometry goes in the Western fencing tradition, goes even further back, before Camillo Agrippa. You have a quote from Filippo Vardi, an Italian fencing master, and I have the English translation, from the end of the 15th century. So that was like 60, probably 60 or 70 years before Camillo Agrippa. And he writes, geometry divides and separates with infinite numbers and measures that fill pages with knowledge. The sword is under its purview, since it is useful to measure blows and steps in order to make the signs more secure. Fencing is born from geometry. This is the, like the first trace we can find for this for this thought. Yeah. And interestingly, this is just a detour now, but I have to do because I'm from the German Lake Museum. Um, there are strong arguments, friend Peter Jonsson from Uppsala pointed this out, there's very strong arguments that also the design of high and late medieval sword was based on geometries. Like you can you can fit these swords very easily into geometrical patterns. And this is not necessary to make a, a sword a fighting weapon. Chinese great swords, the Jan, are not constructed like this. Other swords are not constructed like this. But European swords are, to a very large degree, from this time. So, if it is a phenomenon we have seen that can be traced with a straight line, the straight punch, from Camillo Agrippa to modern uh, fencing or the self-defense uh, books, um, the question for me is also, is it a universal phenomenon? Did people at different times and different places have this same idea? Where in the globalized world of martial arts, where does it uh, come up? So is it a universal thing? This is a picture from a fencing book from 1630, from the Thibault. Thibault was a fencing master, a Belgian fencing master, uh, teaching in France uh, the Spanish school of fencing. And the Spanish school of fencing was extremely heavily relying on geometrical patterns. Yeah. And they have this, this mysterious circle, the Cercle Mysterieux. Yeah. And this is the full title of the book. Yeah. And this is enough quote to explain what, what his idea is all about. Yeah, you can see it here. It demonstrates, according to mathematical rules, the on, the, on the fundament of a, of a mysterious circle, the theory and practice of the vrai, of the true, yeah and until known secret art <laughs> of how to use the weapon on foot and on horse. You have to fight according to this, you have to fight according to this geometry, then you are invincible. Yeah. Thibault also shows in the book how, we, how you would use these techniques against somebody armed with a gun, for example. Um, this is from 1630. Now I have a... Uh, the grandmaster of the package judgment system uh, scribbled down for us a couple of years ago. Yeah. Here, he in a lecture, he gave an overview over the over the uh, geometrical foundation of the package judgment system. Package judgment, Kali is a Filipino fighting system that also is heavily dealing with blade weapons. The blade, blade fighting, knife and sword fighting is like the the, the fundamental uh, approach, and from there all the other. Um, combat methods develop. And according to him, the whole system can be expressed in geometrical patterns. So he calls this the tri -V formula, and you can see how, how complicated and intricate this method is. I will not try to explain it because when once you're there, it's uh, 
uh, you need the grandmaster himself to explain. Yeah, and people usually don't get it. I do not <laughs> claim that I have gotten it. <laughs> but you see the similarity um, of the of the thought that stands behind these two ideas. And I have a recent quote um, from the man who wrote down this or draw this geometrical pattern. Um, this is like one big old. He posted this on Facebook. Now today, when the blade starts to rock and roll, the approach to problem solving is based on the principle of exact science geometry, otherwise known inside Pekitetur Shakali as combat geometry supported by sacred geometry. And this is the interesting word here, by sacred geometry. You know, it is the truth, the truth, the fundaments of the world, the fundaments of how God created the world, the way we fence. And another quote from him, I haven't written it down here, because we have a system of geometrical equation, we have a system of non-counterability. This is the line of thought that stands behind this. So, the question now, is this a globalized one? We have the Spanish fencing school here, we have a Filipino system in the 21st century, and there's always been speculations on how much uh, the Filipino system was influenced by the Spanish schools. And now this is very interesting. We have a certificate of a Filipino fencing master from Manila living and training in Mexico City for a while because the Philippines were ruled from Mexico City under Spanish rule. And he's taking his exam on the Philippines uh, on, in Mexico in Spanish fencing. And he was said to have practiced the use of arms and he's well informed regarding the science of the rules, postures, demonstrations, techniques, and defenses. He was axeman. He was being fought up and capable, and um, he was named uh, deputy senior master to the aforementioned city of Manila for fencing. The aforementioned candidate fought with various opponents in the contest using single sword, sword and dagger, sword and round shield, halberd and pike, and he was declared very capable and knowledgeable in the art and mathematics of arms and the philosophy. Um, the Filipino martial arts of today are not just an offspring of, um, of Spanish systems. I think there's very much indigenous Filipino to it. There's influences from <coughs> Indonesia, there's influences from southern Chinese systems, definitely. But I think that there are lines of thoughts that have been given on and given on in trade over centuries. And I think yeah, you have an idea. So I think this should also challenge the way we perceive martial arts if this is the Western, this is the Eastern, because this is going on in uh, 1730. Yeah. There were connections always. As soon as people had connections, there was also a connection of martial arts, of the way they fought. Yeah. Because in a world of martial arts where we think about the combative aspects, you cannot, you must not be ignorant to what the other one is doing. Yeah. Because, of course, he poses the question, I want to hit you, so you have to find an answer. All martial arts are just one language uh, with different dialects, as long as the combative applications are concerned. I think. So, Thank you very much. <laughs>